Well, now, a puzzling story. Someone who clearly has enemies, but no one can fathom why. The events took place in Cambridge back in mid-November. Sam? Sam, wake oh. up. Oh. It's your car. Oh. I'm going to ring the fire brigade. Ian and Sam had been together for about a year. Ian had been born in New Zealand and adopted by a couple in Hong Kong, but had later moved to England. He was a keen bodybuilder and was working as a bouncer. He was planning to set up his own firm of doorman. I was in the area, so I thought I'd pop round. Oh, yeah? What are you up to? You couldn't do us a favour and take a shop in, could you? It's just we haven't got a car at the moment. Immediately afterwards? When we're finished here, yeah. I know how long your shopping takes. It won't be long. Come on, Sam, get a smaller packet. We're not made of money. What, like you're buying a small bottle of Coke? I remember seeing this man just hanging around, just waiting. He was about 21, 22 years old and about six foot tall and he wore a black puffer jacket. He also had some kind of tattoo on his neck. A few hundred yards away in the grounds of Fullbourne Hospital, a member of staff saw something that unsettled her. I thought it was strange that these men were sitting outside in the car, as this area is normally only used by people that work in here. The car was an old style white Ford Fiesta. There were three men sitting in there. They were staring at me and they made me feel very uncomfortable. The driver of the car I describe as about 22 to 27 years old. He was stocky and muscular. He had short dark brown hair and an athletic looking face. The front seat passenger was a similar age but had a square of face. They were both wearing black bomber jackets. You lot took your time. No, we spent ages queuing. Oh. Well, I noticed this man. He appeared to be deliberately making himself obvious to us. He was slim to medium build, 25 to 30, about 5 foot 9, and was wearing a black puffer jacket and a black baseball cap. What's he up to? No idea. Even See that bloke? Yeah, why? Nothing. He ran across the road onto the wasteland anyway.
you know that guy outside? Yeah. I think he talks to your car. Are you all right? Yeah, fine. Look, you okay to cook tonight? Yeah. How long is it going to take? About 20 minutes. I'll try and be back. Just be careful. Fifteen minutes later, a driver was travelling on Airport Way onto Newmarket Road towards the centre of Cambridge. The car was white. It was travelling really fast, maybe as much as 80 miles an hour. I think there were three people inside. The front seat passenger, he was stocky. He was bigger than the driver. Hi. Um, no, I'm not fine. Um, it's just, it's just that Ian went out a while ago and he hasn't come back. I don't think I ever recovered from the loss of him. I'll never get over that. I felt that we belonged together. We felt we were destined to be together, and that's why I enjoyed being together so much because we felt it was really right. And when you lose somebody just like that, for no apparent reason, and I feel like part of me is missing. Ian had been shot in the head. Now, David Beck, why? What sort of motives are you looking into in this? We're exploring a number of possible motives. Uh, but in particular, we need to be asking people to tell us any details about Ian's private life outside the life that we knew he led in the gyms, in the doors, and in the clubs and the bodybuilding. Now, of course, he might have made uh, enemies as a, as a doorman, uh, either because he didn't let someone into a club at some stage or because he was setting up a rival business. We know that Ian was using steroids. And we know that one of the effects of steroids is to make people become occasionally, suddenly, and uncharacteristically aggressive. It may possibly be, as a result of that, that he may have upset one or two people. But not enough, I think, for them to have committed murder. So you think that uh, he may have deliberately gone out knowing people waiting for him, knowing that it was likely to be a fight, some other people may have gone to sort something out with him, but not ever intended that someone should have a gun and shoot him? I think it's highly likely that Ian Grant knew who he was going to meet that night. I believe there were several people there. I don't know exactly how many, but a number of people there. Now, it may be that many of those people went there that night not expecting there to be a murder. Now, if those people who are there, or if people who know them, call us, will they face a murder charge if they get in contact with you, or, or will they not? I mean, that's, that's going to be a critical issue for them. As I, as I said, we don't know why people went there. It's important for us to find out. But I repeat my appeal to anyone who did go there, possibly not expecting a murder to take place, please examine your conscience and come forward to us. OK, well, if it does help, uh, there is a reward. Calls to this programme come in live to detectives here in the studio, or you can call the instant room number. That's on 01480 456 treble 1. That's Huntingdon 456 treble 1. This now is one of the cruelest crimes we have ever covered. The victim of a burglary was left callously and tightly tied up for a week and a half to die. It started on, of all times, Christmas Day, when crime is almost non-existent. Yet two break-ins happened within a few yards of each other off the high street in London's Camden Town. Oh, this is great. There we go. Did you make it yourself, Cam? This is the camera set up. <laughs> Looks He's beautiful. Good. Face the camera. Oh. Right. Yeah. Right. Look, thinks he's a court photographer. How are we looking? <laughs> Alan Holmes lived by himself on Parkway, one of the main roads through Camden. He'd moved over from Northern Ireland 32 years ago and worked as a garage attendant at Kentish Town Police Station. He was a private man, but had lots of friends, including the Horgan family, at whose house he spent Christmas. For you. Oh, that's milk, do they? Oh, you're embarrassing me. I didn't know we were giving presents. Be so silly. Look, I'll open it later, all right? Yeah, go on, open it now. Let's see what we've got then. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So bloody cold in your place. 
at 11.10 on Christmas night in Camden High Street, around the corner from Alan's flat. I think we better get down to Callum's. The front door's out, it's been a break. UK receiving 809. Leave that for now. Take Alan home first when we get back. Oh, okay. Oh. There's a guy inside, I think. You take the left, I'll take the right. There you go, Neil. You there. There. I've got him. I've got him. Somebody at the back, I can hear them. You all right? Yeah, I've got him. A helicopter was called in with thermal imaging equipment to scan the rooftops, but the burglar wasn't found. This will do fine. We'll take you to the door. No, honestly, I, I need a walk after all that food. Good night, Pat. Oh, good night. Mm. Happy Christmas, Alan. Merry Christmas to both of you. Yes. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. This man, because he seemed to have tried about four or five times to get money out, as if he was trying different numbers. He was very calm about it, despite it taking a couple of minutes. I'd say he was about 22 to 25, six foot one, slim athletic bell with short cropped hair, a number two cut. He wore a light grey hooded top, like a sweatshirt type, and blue denim jeans, and he was wearing sand coloured Timberland boots. He was always out and about, so it wasn't unusual for him not to not to be there. Just just the idea of him suffering when I was trying to contact him it seemed so cruel. It just 
it's something that'll, I think it'll haunt me for the rest of my days. At the Shell building on the South Bank in London, Alan's card was used in the Lloyd's cash till seven times. Any sign up in the windows? No, no sign. He's on the second and third floors. I think it'll get long enough. Let's put the door in. Yeah. Please. I just couldn't bear the idea that he wouldn't pull through. But I'm afraid he died the following morning at 11 o'clock. I lost not only my brother, but a, my dearest friend. We were very close. The horror of how Alan died is frankly not suitable for broadcast. John Yates, perhaps we should make it clear, first of all, that when there was the break-in at Cullen's, the supermarket, and one man was arrested there, you're pretty sure that he had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with this murder. That's correct. He's been completely eliminated from the murder inquiry. Yeah. So the, one sort of burglary was happening and someone else was in looting as well, That's and had then sort of escaped round the back. And went, why did they choose Alan's flat? Well, it was the only occupied flat in that block. Um, the, plot, the block's been redeveloped at the moment, and uh, that was the only flat that was occupied. Now, how can our viewers help? What can they do? Well, there's a number of areas that we're looking for help. Um, first is the, is the man who you saw uh, on the film who drew the police's attention to the burglary. Um, he may not know it, but he may have some very useful information that could help this inquiry. Just to quickly reiterate, he's a man in his mid to late 20s, wearing a brown leather jacket, he wore a red top and he had a scarf, and he was there around about 11.15 on Christmas night. OK, now he was helping, we're not he was helping, he absolutely, in any yes. way involved in this. Absolutely crime. OK. Now, beyond that, what time could people have seen the man who actually did it? What time would he have left Alan's flat? Well, we're looking for anybody who was round about the Camden Town tube station area um, in the, uh, the late evening of Christmas Day and the early hours of Boxing Day, right up until the tube station opened around about 8 a.m. that morning. This link with the South Bank and the Shell Centre, where he was using the Lloyd's uh, cash tell. Do you, do you see any link there? Is that significant? We're looking for help in shedding some light on this link between the, the Shell Centre on the South Bank, next to Waterloo Station. Does our, does our individual live, live there? Does he travel or work there? There's definitely a link between the South Bank and Camden Town. We're looking for help to shed some light on that. What was taken apart from his wallet, his, his cards? We have some silver photo frames. Um, I emphasise the, the picture you see is a computer-generated enhancement. It's not an exact one. And they're about five inches by four inches. There's two of them. They've been in the family for some generations. Have you bought these or have you been offered them and bought them unwittingly? OK, they'd be over 100 years old then. They would be, yeah. Presumably, he wouldn't have kept this to himself, or would he? What do you think? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an appalling crime. It's, 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 it's difficult to imagine the, the, the dreadful circumstances in which Alan died. And I've just asked, finally, to people to focus on this point. Alan was tied up for 10 days, and during that 10 days, uh, his bank account was milked of approaching £1,000. It's inconceivable, I think, that the man or the individual responsible hasn't boasted or bragged about this to his friends, his family, or even his associates. We want their help now in bringing this man to justice. John, thank you very much. Please don't hesitate to call if you can help. Here's our number in the studio, 0500 600 600. That's a free call number. Please don't let this dreadful, dreadful crime go unresolved. Here's the incident room number, if you prefer to call that. So that's on 0181 733 6257. 0181 733 6257. There is the worst crime you can get. But in our next case, someone not only murdered, but then trying to cover up the evidence, set fire to a flat in a block in which some 55 people were asleep. This is St Mary's in Walthamstow, East London, and Joy Hewer went there every week. 
She retired early as a school teacher and devoted all her energies to church work. She helped run soup kitchens, do office work and volunteered for cleaning. Hi Joy, how are you this morning? I'm exhausted. Joy would very simply have said that her life centred around Jesus. That was her life and it was expressed by involvement in churches. When you arrive as a new vicar in a parish, uh, as I did uh, in July 94 here at St Mary's Walthamstow, um, some people uh, avoid you because they think you're busy settling in or they, they think the vicar's too important to come and call on. But one of the very first person to call on me was Joy Hewer. He said, I just want to welcome you to Walthamstow, and you and your family, and say how pleased we are that you've come. Uh, and she had a bunch of flowers to give us. She had a big grin all over her face and just said, it's so nice to have you. And uh, off she went. One of the churches that Joy attended on a regular basis over the last two or three years was the London Healing Mission in Notting Hill Gate in West London. It was an important part of her life and she went there every Tuesday and Thursday regularly. She attended meetings there, I believe, on those days and also helped out with some of the administration connected with the church. That evening, Tuesday, October the 17th, Joy got home about six o'clock. The couple living two floors beneath her were also home that evening. I'm back! Oh, your mum called. How long ago? Just now. Okay. Upstairs, Joy was staying in and was also on the phone. Hello, Steve. Oh, Tim. Is your dad there? When will he be back? Can you tell him I called? and ask him to give me a ring back. It's nothing terribly important, um, but I'll be in all night if he wants to give me a call. Lovely. Thanks. Bye. I remember that I had a bad stomach, so I went to bed around 10 o'clock, and my boyfriend went with me, and he fell asleep nearly straight away. About 10.30, I was woken by lots of banging noises, crashing furniture being thrown around or something. And I was a bit worried because the flat above was empty and I thought somebody might have broken in there. Carried on for at least five, ten minutes. After it went quiet, somebody started running downstairs really fast. Heavy feet. Must have been a heavy person. Sometime after 10.30, a motorist on Forest Road almost collided with a man sprinting from St David's Court. Did you see something too? Another motorist, a good Samaritan, may be a further crucial witness. Was this you? Hello, you know the junction um, at, it's in E17, yeah? Walthamstow. St David's Court, a block of flats. Is it a junction? Yeah. yeah. I was just driving past there and I saw like flames coming out one of the, one of the um, floors. I'm not sure what floor it is, but I just saw it and I thought, well, I'd better just. Uh, yeah. So when you say it's at the junction, what's it at the junction of? Hold on. Let me ask someone. Excuse me. Do you know the name of this street? What? Yeah. It's um. Yeah. Yeah, Walthamstow Town Hall is in the um the junction of Wood Street. I think it's Forest Street, the Forest other one. Forest Street. OK, we're on our way. Yeah? OK, then. Uh, does that come up? Yeah, we're on our way now. Yeah, OK, then. All right, right. Bye. Bye. And who was the helpful man at the bus stop? Um, we had no idea if anyone was involved in the fire. There were obvious signs of smoke on the lobby, so we had to move quite fast. When Farman found Joy, she was already dead. She'd been stabbed. Can you imagine what it's like for my parents? I mean, my parents are both very elderly now. They're not too well. For, you, for parents to see a child die in any circumstance before they go is pretty catastrophic. But for it to happen in this way is just totally devastating. And they told me that, you know, what they dread 
It's waking up each morning and just having to face it all over again because it just doesn't get any easier. It just goes on and on and on. John Arthur, the main suspect just has to be the man running out of the flats and David's court across the road. Yes, indeed. We are very anxious to trace the individual that ran across the road sometime after 10.30. Uh, he's quite distinctive. He's black. He's very thin, very tall. Six foot four, in fact, the witness has described him as. Um, he ran very fast from the steps of the flat into the road. In fact, a motorist had to take evasive action, otherwise there would have been an accident. Now, six foot four, that is very, very tall. Yes, Perhaps it is. Perhaps fewer than one in 200 men are going to be that, that big. Obviously, when you're driving, you're looking up at somebody. Maybe he looked bigger than he really was, but he's certainly tall. He, he was thin. six foot four because the, the witness has been seen, and yes, I'm happy with that description. Now, there was another man you need to, not so much eliminate, but a potential witness who was there some hours earlier, three or four hours earlier. That's right. We've been fortunate. We've actually traced the majority of people that were at the flat on that day. However, at 6.35, a white man was seen at the flat by the lifts talking to a young couple that were bringing furniture into the flat. And he is described as being, he's white, he's 21, 24 years of age, five foot seven tall. He's well spoken with a southern accent and he has a boyish face. I don't believe he may be in, uh, involved in the, uh, in, the, in the investigation, but we need to eliminate him. Now, I've been to the flat. Joy had a, a spy hole. She could see people who were outside, and she was certainly dressed in her night attire when the, she answered the door. I mean, it must have been someone she knew, or presumably it was someone she knew she let in. Well, that's right, Nick. I, I am of the opinion that she knew the person that actually uh, came into the flat that night and actually killed her. She was a cautious person. We know that from our investigation. She would use the uh, stairs rather than the lifts. She would use the British Rail stations rather than underground when travelling to London. So in my opinion, she would not have allowed anybody into that flat unless she knew who that was. So you need was. to know everybody who knew Joy or who knew every, just any pieces of the jigsaw that you can bring together about her life and who she knew? That's absolutely right. At the moment, is a motiveless crime. We need to hear from all people that, that knew her in order that we can ascertain a background and uh, there certainly she attended various churches one was the london healing mission and we would like to hear from uh, present members and past members uh, if they can help us with this investigation and offered thank you uh, very much indeed 0800 600 600 uh, if that's busy then you can try the instant room on 01 81 345 4351 that's 0181 Three four five four three five one. Bobby Jones was someone you could hardly miss. He was six foot four and not surprisingly was well known in his native town of Hastings. His mother died about five years ago and he lived with family friends. By all accounts he was fairly popular with young and old alike, but he must have trodden on someone's toes. And maybe you know why. Or if you live on the south coast, perhaps this film will trigger memories of events that took place eight weeks ago. Sussex murder hunt. This report from Alan Rook. The body was left lying face down in the mud and undergrowth. Police have issued this description. He was white, six foot three inches tall, with close cropped hair. He was wearing a sports jacket with a large diamond shaped umbro motif on the back. An incident room has been set up. 25 officers, many from outside the area, have been drafted in to help with the inquiry. Detectives don't yet know enough to determine. Oh, I know it. Is, is that the police? I've just seen on the news about you having found a body in the park. Our Bobby. Oh, Bobby Jones. He lives with us. And he, he didn't come back last night. And I haven't heard a word from him all day. Well, I was empty. I just couldn't believe, you know, and I kept saying, no, it's not, it can't be Bobby. But it was Bobby. And I just more or less ran out, crying, got in my car, went to work and broke my heart there. If Bobby was in a bad mood, he would have a sour face. But he used to snap out of it. But then the children used to come up, Bobby, can we play football? Away they went. They was gone. This is the one that's got to go out for Maureen. Right. I don't know where she's going to put it exactly, but she is expecting it. This. In the early evening of Tuesday, January the 30th, Bobby was at home helping Doris with various chores. Run the, run the top. 
These boys were also heading out for a family chore. My friend's dad just lives up the road and he needed a tool for his decorating to me and Mark. My friend thought we'd go and take it to him. What about your friend's roof? Picking on you, no? Nah. What's this? It's not mine. It's all right, it's a mate. Wait a moment. The man with Bobby, he had ginger hair, he was dressed scruffy, he had black jogging bottoms on with white bits of clay or paint over him. Come on. See you later. See ya. Let's go back to my gap. Where's that then? Crawborough Road. Yeah. Bobby wasn't out for long. By roughly seven, he was back at home. Just off to bingo. What are you going to do with yourself tonight? Just popping out for a while. OK. See you later. Bye. This is another part of Hastings about an hour later. I went out just before 8 o'clock that evening to start service 32 as normal. It's very quiet as it is on a Tuesday, especially in the winter, nobody about. Shortly before 9 o'clock, a friend of Bobby's was making her way home. As we walked down on opposite sides of the road, Bob waved and I waved back, and a little further down the road he waved again and I waved back, and he was trying to make me laugh, he was a funny person. Hi. How are you doing all right? I'm just home. How yeah. about you? I'm just going down Alexander Park. Yeah? Yeah, I've got to meet some bloke at nine. I guess it's me. Yeah. Do you want a cup of tea? No, no, I've got to go and meet this bloke. Yeah. All right, I'll see you later. Yeah. Where did Bobby go next, and who was he meeting? On the last trip, I was going down the Bohemia Road past kebab shop. I saw Bobby standing with two people. I flashed the lights at him. He waved as he normally does in passing. The other two guys just didn't even look at me. I carried on the journey. Half an hour later, and a mile away, in Alexandra Park. Three hours later, and a few hundred yards up the same road, a shift worker was on her way home through the now deserted park. I remember thinking, how odd. Why would two people, one in the front, one in the back, be sitting in a place like that with no lights knocking them? Next morning, Bobby was found lying nearby. He'd been stabbed in the neck. Kirkbent, have you got anywhere with a motive? Yes, we know that Bobby was a supplier of drugs to friends and acquaintances in all village. He wasn't in it for the money, but for a few days before his death, he'd been talking about making a meet in the park to obtain a supplier. Have people who dealt drugs with him come forward to help with inquiries? We've spoken to many people who have users of drugs, uh, but we must remember here that we're investigating a murder, and there is a reward of £10,000 for the right information. So I think you can read between the lines. You're not too interested in small drug deals. You're interested in information on, on this case. A £10,000 reward. That's right. Now, let's look, first of all, at, at the, the man who is ginger hair that was seen by the two lads. Each of them has, has done uh, what's called a CD fit. Uh, it must be clear that's of the same person. This is the same um, man as seen by each child. One's in colour, incidentally. He's got ginger hair in, in both. The other one's in black and white. Tell us about him. He's described as between 5 foot 2 and 5 foot 8, uh, medium build. Uh, late 20s, early 30s, and with an accent that's uh, not from the area of Hastings, probably from the north. Right, that's in the old London Road that Nick, where Bobby lived. Then in Bohemia Road, uh, about two and a half miles away, at 11 o'clock, two different images. Yes, he was seen by a, a bus driver standing with uh, two other men. They're both described as uh, late teens, early 20s, 
um, medium build between five foot six and five foot eight. The one on the one left has got the red uh, baseball very hat. Very distinctive. On. He's got a red baseball bat, ha a hat turned back to front and is wearing a grey short sleeve, possibly a, a baseball shirt, which was unusual for that time of the year because it was very cold that night. Bobby must have been driven there, must he? Because that's, as I say, a couple of miles from, from where he lives in, in Orr Village. I expect so. He was seen about uh, 5 or 10 to 11, two and a half miles away, closer to where he lived, and uh, somebody would have given them a lift or he got a taxi or something like that. Do you know anything about that car in the park? Have you got any more information on it, what it was like? That's described as a dark-coloured car with a dark rear spoiler. Uh, it's thought to be a Ford Escort type, a Mark III, possibly an XR3 or an XR3i. All right, well, if you can help eliminate any of those, if you can help identify any of those people, here's our number in the studio. We're live, the lines are free, so are the calls, 0500 600 600. Or you can ring the incident room direct, that's on 01 424 456 002. That's Hastings 456 002. It would have been Deborah Wood's 21st birthday. Why she's not alive to celebrate is a mystery that we hope tonight someone will solve. Debbie, who lived in Holbeck in Leeds, disappeared late one afternoon in early January and nothing more was heard of her for well over a week. Officers were first alerted at 4.30 this morning when a resident reported a fire. Police found the burning body of a young girl, aged, they believe, between 15 and 25. Debbie was brought up in Morley, to the south of Leeds, but her parents separated when she was a child. She started drinking in her teens and found it hard to keep a job. But she stayed in Leeds and kept in contact with both parents. Once a week, she met her mum to visit charity shops in Morley. I'm only 21, you know. Mm. Staying at my mate's house for Christmas dinner. Oh, that's good. I tell you what, though, I could really do with some new winter clothes. It's absolutely freezing in that flat. Oh, well, we'll have to see what we can do, <laughs> won't we? Hey, I like that. Yeah? You think it's my colour? Yeah, do you like it? Right. Come on, then. Let's try it on. Oh, they're nice. Ah, we we'll try them on. They're a bit expensive. Oh, don't worry. It's Christmas. I'll treat you. Oh, thanks, Mum. Yeah. What do you think? Ah, it suits you. It really suits you. Yeah. Are you happy with that for your Christmas? Yeah. That'll be six forty nine, love, please. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. When she left school, she got a job, and then she, she managed to get a place of her own. She just chuffed about it. She'd come and go when she wanted. I think she knew quite a lot of people, you know. But she's like me. She'll um, if she if she stood at a bus stop, and she'll just talk to anyone, you know, to get friendly with them. Now police need to trace all Debbie's friends, including two who went to her bedsit in Holbeck shortly before Christmas. I went downstairs to see who was at the door and I saw two men. One I think is called Gary. Debbie in? No. He was about five feet, eight and a half inches tall, had hair that was cropped in the sides and longer and oiled in the top. He was wearing a dark jacket. I would say he was about early to mid-twenties in age. So who are these two? Hey, David, I'll just pop this in there. Ta, put them in. Yeah. I need uh, Lou Rowe. Yeah. Debbie's father met her on the day she disappeared. They went shopping in her local supermarket. He lived nearby. Stuff. Just put it in. Well, it's your money. Yes. Can you do me a favour? Can you drop this stuff off at my flat? Yeah. And I'll see you after. Sure. Is that all right? No problem, look. Leave it with me. Late that morning, Debbie met her father once again in Big Lil's bar in central Leeds. Oh. I wondered how everybody was. Hey, Char, cheers. I'm ready for that then. Hey, by the way, how's your mum? She's all right. I saw her the other day. I like your new gear. Yeah, I got it for Christmas. Can I have a light? Your mum get you that? Yeah, it's all right, isn't it? Hey, you look smart. Hello, mum. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Listen, I haven't got much money. Can you make me an appointment at the housing office for Thursday? Yeah. 
Okay, I'll see you outside the town hall about 10. Okay, see you then. At five o'clock, Debbie left the pub and headed off. But where did she go? She certainly never went home. On the way to, I went about two hours, I kept, I kept walking round, and then I, I came home then. And uh, I thought, well, if she rung me up, I'll tell her off, like, for not meeting me. But I couldn't understand because when we make arrangements to meet anyway, she always turns up. I was driving down Cardigan Road, going into town to meet some friends. I saw this figure of a man over this person on the floor, as if he's trying to pick him up. I, I just thought that it was two mates fighting, you see. So I didn't want to get involved, so I just keep on going. Three and a half hours later, and less than 150 yards away. As I walked down Chapel Lane, I could smell what smelled like a bonfire, and I could hear crackling noises. And as I turned the bend, I could see the fire, and I realized that I should phone the fire brigade. The next day, I saw it on the television. It, they found a, a, a decomposed body, badly burnt, down Burley Railway Station. I know I bought them clothes, and it just fits. What little bits, what, what they found on a body. But I just rung up one morning. Told him that that's my daughter. Well, Detective Superintendent Andy Brown, Debbie's body was set alight. What does that tell us about her killer? It's probably the act of a desperate man, um, an attempt to try and conceal her identity or at least try, try and get rid of the, uh, the evidence that might have connected him to the, to the murder. It did delay us uh, identifying Debbie's body and um, we have had difficulties since with some of the problems. Now, she was last seen on the evening of the 4th of January. Her body was found on the 14th. When do you believe she may have been killed? We think she actually um, was killed shortly after she left Big Lil's pub in the city centre of Leeds. Um, and then there we have this 10-day gap where someone's either kept her in storage or has known where she's been. And then something has prompted that person to actually take her to the railway station and set a light to a body. It is difficult, isn't it, in 10 days to hide a body from anyone else, really? Yes, it is, but it, it depends where it's been kept, and we don't know what the reason uh, was for actually uh, setting it on fire on the 14th. So it's vital, really vitally important, that you trace Debbie's movements on the 4th of January after she left Big Lil's pub. The, the, the important thing is we, we don't know why she was in the Burley area. Um, it may well be that it's the murderers from the Bur Burley area and that's, uh, that's why she's ended up in that, in that area. We have not found any friends or any pubs that she's visited. Uh, it's a mystery why she's, she's actually ended up uh, in Burley. Now the person that we saw in that reconstruction, a so-called friend called Gary, you've traced a lot of her friends but you haven't managed to trace him. We've traced a large amount of friends but uh, Gary's someone that was obviously on the scene um, around Christmas time so we are interested in him. He hasn't come forward. We know that he went to a home uh, in Beverly Terrace. He went with another man on one occasion. We haven't traced Gary. I want him to come forward or someone to tell us who he is. Another significant sighting, again, the, the one we saw in the film, was the person bending over what appeared to be a body or certainly a figure in the Burley area shortly before the fire was found. It was only a few hours before, and uh, I mean, the worst scenario was that it was actually someone dragging Debbie's body to the railway station, which again would... Uh, lead us to think that the killer is from the Burley area. There may be an innocent explanation, uh, and if there is, then we need someone to come forward and give us that explanation. Andy Brown, thank you very much indeed. Well, as always, do call us here if you can help. It's vitally important that we catch this person. Remember, it is a free call number. Or if the numbers here are busy, as they are at the moment, try the incident room in Leeds. That's a free phone, and that's 0800 318 001. That's 0800 318 001 sort of publicity they've attracted locally and this gives you an impression of just how serious these offences are. 
Our reconstruction shows none of this violence, of course, but what it does do is build up a detailed account of him. We hope enough for someone to name him before the reconstruction's over. Main story this lunchtime, Welsh beef farmers fear a new BSE scare could blight their industry. Welsh beef... Hello? I'm awfully sorry, I meant to press number two. Mrs Morgan? Oh, she's moved to the parade. I wonder if you could write the address down for me, please. There you are. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Stephen, Mrs. Morgan's nephew. <clears throat> I wonder if I could have a drink of water. I've got a tickle in my throat. It feels just like a feather. Well, wait a minute, then. I obviously uh, felt Thank suspicious you. of him, and that's why I kept watching every move he made. Do you mind if I use the telephone? I'll reverse the charges. Oh, all right then. I was determined I wasn't going to lose my cool and let him think that I was nervous. So I sat as relaxed as he did in the chair opposite. Engaged. I'm from Worcester. I did live in Cheltenham before that. When I was here last September or October, there was no water in that lake. There were tractors working in there. I used to go swimming about 15 years ago in a pool over there. He finished the cigarette and left. It was only then she discovered her handbag had been rifled. Sorry to disturb you, but have some keys been put through your door? Keys? What keys? Mine. I was told they were in the first flat. Ah, well, you might want to be over there. He's in. His umbrella's there. Ring the bell. I was told it was an elderly woman's flat. I had a good look at him, and I would think he would be about five feet eight. Um, sallow complexion, uh, quite a bouffant hairstyle. Then I came in here and stood there where I could see him walk right along, knowing that he'd arrived at Enid Poole's flat. Though Aunt Enid um, had failing sight, she was able to live in her flat and was able to make a cup of tea and with support she liked her flat very much. He was in Enid Poole's flat for less than 10 minutes in which time he attacked the 90 year old very severely and left her unconscious. What's up, Dylan? I feel a bit disturbed, Gordon. I've had a funny caller. Can I come in? Come in, Emily. Would you know him again, though, Dill? Oh, yes, I had a good look at him. He had a oh, black leather jacket on and some... Uh... Is that him, Dill? That's him, yes. It looks like if he's going somewhere. Oh, yes. When I took my class... Right. A quarter of a mile away, Maya Locher was making her way home from a weekly pensioners' get-together. You sure? My aunt was a retired head teacher, and on that Wednesday afternoon, she'd been to the Wednesday Club, which is an offspin of the Town Women's Guild. She liked to have a little walk, if possible, not every day, but a few times a week. Hello, Maya. I'm not wearing my hearing aid. Give you a ring later. Why?
Maya Locher was badly beaten. She too was left unconscious. We were chatting amongst ourselves again, and then I think it was Gordon said, He's going out. Yes, that's him. I wonder where he's going now. And then suddenly he stopped and he looked at Laurel Court quite slowly, and that was the last we saw. Him. Two hours later, Mrs. Poole's stolen cash card was used at this bank in Cardiff. Three attempts were made to withdraw £200. All were unsuccessful. About eight o'clock, um, I had a telephone call from my cousin in Worcestershire, and she asked me, is Aunt Enid all right, or is she ill, or is she out this evening, because I cannot get a reply. So I said, right, I'll try and... I'll ring her and see. And then I said to my husband, um, we must go down straight away and see what's the matter. When the police arrived, they found Mrs. Poole on the floor. A month later, she's still critically ill. Miss Locher was discovered the next day and is also still in hospital. Wynne Phillips, you're looking for a violent and heartless man here. These were particularly vicious attacks, weren't they? That's correct. They were brutal attacks on defenceless old women. Um, luckily, they're both now recovering in hospital. Now, you have reason to believe that he's struck again since those incidents. Yes, I, I believe he has. Uh, about a fortnight ago in the Cardiff area, there were some striking similarities uh, to an offence there, which were very, very similar to the, to the Barry jobs. But no one was hurt? No one was hurt in that instance. Now, obviously, we don't want to alarm elderly people living on their own, but they do right. presumably want to be on their guard as a result well, of this. Right. What advice exactly. do you give? To well, don't allow strangers into, the, into your homes. Um, seek ID. Uh, if you're not sure of people, then ring the police, uh, ring neighbours, family, friends. Um, if you think police, then call the police. Mm. So, what do we know about him? You have well, any fit? We know he's about five foot eight, five foot ten in height. He's of slim to medium build, uh, dark hair, brushed back and possibly gelled. He's of sallow complexion. Um, on the day in question, he was wearing a black leather jacket and turquoise trousers. And he seems to have a connection with the area. I think so. Although he may be, not be a native of Barry, he seems to know quite a bit about the area. Um, certainly knew that the, that the lake in the Nap area of Barry, uh, last September, October, had been cleaned, had been drained. Um, he also spoke about swimming in the swimming pool there some years previously. Um, he also spoke about Worcester, Cheltenham. He may know something about those areas. And in the first uh, scene that we saw, he used a pe peculiar turn of phrase a couple of times. Let's see it again. I wonder if I could have a drink of water. I've got a tickle in my throat. It feels just like a feather. Well, wait a minute, then. Just like a feather. It's an unusual thing to say. It is it? unusual, and it's unusual in, in most parts of South Wales, I would think. But somebody must know who uses that type of phrase. If they do, if he fits the description, then please give us a ring and let us know. Now, we have some items here similar to the ones that he took, the Barclays yes, Connect right. card. That's right. Now, what can you tell us about that? Well, the name Enid Poole is on that. We've not recovered it. Anybody who's seen that, uh, come, if, if, if anybody's been given that, found it, please contact us. And something slightly more identifiable, perhaps, is this key fob? Yes, he, he certainly locked Mrs. Poole in her home. Uh, he took the keys and he took a fob just like that, um, a lace inset uh, with the letter E. So this is a B, but it's very similar to this. Very similar to that, e. yes. We'd be in interested in anybody who may come across that. Well, Wynne Phillips, thank you very much indeed. Obviously, you're concerned he may strike again, so it's essential, obviously, that he's, it is he's essential. caught. Yes. Well, here's how to help if you do know. Just make that free call, 0500 600 600. Make a note of it, 0500 600 600. It's good for all the cases tonight. Or you can call the incident room in Barry Direct. That's on 01446 731 609. That's Barry 731. 609. Here's a car was used as a murder weapon. Now, running someone over accidentally is tragic, but the driver who hit Danny Marlowe apparently did so deliberately. Why anyone should wish to harm this taxi driver from Market Harbour is a mystery. Yes, yeah, four, go ahead. Yeah, sure, all right, but I'm going to the bookies now. I've got to put a bet on the 245 at Epsom. I would say everybody knew him. You know, they'd say, Danny Marley, yeah, I know him. He was known for his, um, his funniness, his sense of humour, mainly. Like, if I was in a bad mood with him, 
he'd, by the end of the day, I couldn't be, you know what I mean? He'd be messing about and trying to make me laugh and things like that, even though, you know, I was trying to be angry with him, I can't do it. He was a good dad. He'd take him anywhere, he'd buy him anything. Um, he always took him to the pictures or if they wanted to go somewhere, like the amusement parks and that, he took him to all them. Some people didn't know how to take him. Once they got to know Danny, they knew how to take his sense of humour. Sometimes he'd get their back up and then the next minute they'd be all together laughing, joking and forgotten about. It's 7.30 on the evening of Thursday the 22nd of February and Danny, who plays pool for his local team, is due to join them for an away match. Who was that? Don't know. He asked if we were playing away tonight. Said he'd be there to cheer us on. You're not expecting any trouble, are you? Oh, I'll be all right. This was the first in a series of anonymous calls that Danny received over the next three weeks. Go to the pot, Danny. Superb. Danny Marlowe, is there Danny Marlowe here, please? Yeah, I'm Danny Marlowe. Telephone. Hello? Yeah, I'm Danny Marlowe. No, mate. No, you got the wrong one. No, there's, uh, there's another Danny Marlowe lives in Kibworth. Yeah, he plays pool as well. That's all right. Bye. For the second time that night, Danny had taken a mysterious phone call. Who was he trying to fob off? It's just before eight, and Danny's on the way to a pool match, this time at home in the pub at the end of his street. Nice break. Call that a nice break? I could do better than that with my eyes closed. Yeah, and one arm tied behind your back, eh? <laughs> Danny? I I Danny? Here, though. Danny? It's a phone call for you, OK? Again, a male voice, again anonymous, and at the same time of night, 10.30. I was watching telly most of the night, then emptied the washing machine, and then I went up to bed about 20 to 11. Danny left the pub soon after the call and walked back home to Caxton Street. What's all this then? I live in Caxton Street when I was just about to go to sleep and heard two male voices. Didn't think anything of it at all. Just sounded like two people were just coming from the pub, two mates talking. But as they were getting further apart, they were still shouting to each other. A few seconds later, I heard a car pulling up really fast. Then I heard like clattering noises. When they said, I think Danny's had an accident, he's lying in the road, I thought perhaps he's had a bit of an argument with somebody and maybe he's been roughed up a bit. Um, and when I got outside and just see him laying there and seeing his injuries, I thought, no, it can't be him lying there. You know, it didn't sink in. I knew it was him, but I suppose I didn't want to believe it was him. Danny's injuries were so severe that he died on the way to hospital. Forty minutes later, a stolen Ford Granada was found burning nine miles away. Was this the car that killed Danny and left two boys without a father? I don't quite know what to say to him. You know, what, what can you say? I can't tell him why the dad was killed. I can't tell him because I don't know him myself. We say he's gone to heaven. We go up to grave, we sit, we talk to him, and that's what they do. They tell him what they've done, you know, in that day or that week. Say bye to him, tell him they love him, and then we come away. Bob, 
Bob Small, you're treating Danny's death as suspicious. Do you believe he was deliberately run over? It's very difficult to say for certain what, it, what did take place in Caxton Street, but there are certainly aspects of the, the case uh, that make me suspicious, um, and I believe that he was deliberately run over. Certainly the injuries that he sustained aren't consistent with those you might expect to find on a normal hit and run. It's very likely, in fact, that Danny could well have been lying in the road before he was run over. So if it was deliberate, why? Well, we've done extensive inquiries into his background, and so far we've been able, unable to come up with a specific motive. We are aware that he has um, several debts, but none of a particularly substantial nature. Uh, it is possible that he has other non-legitimate debts that we're yet uh, to find out about and that certainly the phone calls could be connected with people trying to recover that money. So you want uh, calls from people who may be able to provide a motive, obviously, Most definitely, in that yes. way. Now, that car that was found burning on that night, how much emphasis are you putting on that and linking that to the, to the murder? Although we can't categorically link the car to the inquiry, we believe it is involved. And certainly residents in Caxton Street do recall a high-powered automatic car uh, leaving the scene. In fact, one man went so far to say is that he believed um, the sound of the engine to be an automatic uh, high-powered Granada car. Now, that car had been stolen a week before, so you want to know its movements, don't you? We certainly do. It was stolen on the 28th of February from no uh, Northampton. Uh, it's been somewhere in the week between the 28th and, and the, the night of Danny's death. It's either been stored or been used. We believe that there are people out there that can help us uh, tell us the whereabouts of that car. Do you think there's more than one person involved in all this? I do believe that there are people that can help us shed light on the circumstances surrounding Danny's death. They may well not have been uh, present at the time he's run over, and it's those people that we'd appeal to come forward. And I know there is a reward, and you're also wanting to trace uh, a potential witness who was seen jogging outside the Bell pub on a mobile phone, getting into a red metro about the time that, that Danny was was knocked down. That's correct. He's a possibly a potential witness. Thank you very much indeed, Bob. Well, if there's any way you can help find Danny's killer, please do call 0500 600 600 or you can call the incident room direct on 0116 248 3817. That's Leicester 248 3817. In British criminal history. You might have seen it highlighted again because of this programme in the newspapers today. Yes, well, tonight a father and his lone surviving daughter help us appeal about the attack eight weeks ago in which someone bludgeoned his wife and his other child to death, along with the family dog. Sean Russell is a university lecturer. He's a botanist. His wife, Lynn, was a geologist. And the girls were described as cheerful, bright and popular at school. The tragedy happened on a footpath coming home from school in one of the most rural and scenic parts of Kent. Lynn and her six-year-old daughter, Megan, died. Josie, who's nine, survived, though with serious head injuries. <laughs> Megan and Josephine had a very bright and happy future ahead of them. It had changed my priorities in life from pursuing work Megan, Josie, come and have to a putting my family first. Yeah. Isn't it gorgeous? Of it like Both of us, Lynn and I, were surprised that they were such lovely children. Uh, maybe we felt that we were a bit, um, being scientists, we were a bit precise and unemotional. But the children turned out to be very loving. And goes like that, that's like right. that, then that, then that, then that. That's right, and there's a little tiny bug inside. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, let's go and look at the larkspur. Don't think you've seen those, have you? No. Why are you too busy playing? My wife was, um, well, I've had so many wonderful letters from people around the world saying how much they admired her, how strong a character what she was, how principled. She was very academically brilliant, but from the minute Josephine was born, she gave up her job and she became completely committed to bringing up the family. Hey, how is the swimming? Yeah, it's really good. Actually, Mum. Oh, excellent. Well you done. You should have seen me, Mum. Oh, what about you? 
Oh dear. Never mind, better luck next time. That Tuesday, Tuesday the 9th of July, Lynn picked up her children from the village school at Goodniston. They regularly walked home, a half an hour's jaunt across the country. About 20 minutes later, 20 past four, a driver suffering from hay fever remembers a woman, two girls and a dog joining the Aylsham to Staple Road. This is Buckland Lane near Goodniston, some eight miles outside Canterbury. The date again, Tuesday the 9th of July. Were you around here at that time? Do you remember seeing the Russells or anyone else? Last steps taken by the Russells were along this track, used regularly by locals, known as Cherry Garden Lane. Look, when they get in, you two rush yeah. upstairs and get changed, and I'll get yeah. changed. <gasps> Flowers still mark the spot where the family was attacked. Lynn and Megan died, as did the dog. Josie was so badly injured that at first she was thought to be dead too. Since the murders two months ago, police have pieced together a great deal, but they now need new leads on three separate sightings. The first is back along the Aylsham to Staple Road. A woman came across a beige car pulling away from a junction that led to the murder scene. It was going really slowly. Oh, come on. So slow that I had to brake and change down gears, and then I was right behind him. I noticed that he was looking at me from his wing mirror. Yes. He looked so agitated and really angry. And even when I turned to go around the corner, I noticed that he was still looking at me to check if I was going to follow him. About half a mile away, there's a local landmark outside Chillenden village. At about the same time, a woman was driving out of the village on Cave Lane and approaching the windmill when she saw a man standing by the road. She then saw him cross the road. His path may have taken him from the murder scene in these woods. He was heading roughly towards the rolling court area about half a mile away. That's where a farm worker saw a car. That's when I noticed a man standing at the end of his car looking around, acting suspicious. He was up and down the bank, looking across the fields, all around him. Like the one seen earlier, the car was beige. He uh, started to jog down the road towards my direction, so I looked away because I didn't want to see him staring at me. Right? When I looked back up, he was running back towards his car. Just the way the man was acting, really like suspicious. I knew he'd been up to say, I've riding something. Just didn't know at the time. I took the dog round for a walk about a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes after walking up, and I was looking where, where he was parked, where he was standing. And then the dog pulled in towards the edge, and I noticed a bag being stuffed in the bushes. The bag contained blood stained strips of towel, and the blood was from the Russells. In every sense, the family has been destroyed. I can never have that again. Not as... as full and complete a family life. I don't believe I'll ever find that again. It's like one... Hopefully, half of my life has come to an end and I start a new half from a much more impoverished point. The gold I have left is Josephine. 
late July. I just have to look at her to see the way she's um, got better so quickly. That's what gives me strength to carry on. But I cannot make head nor tail of why a woman and two children and a dog would be attacked in that manner in the open countryside. Why? I think that's a word on everyone's lips. Uh, Detective Chief Inspector Dave Stevens, these are despicable murders. The intention was to slaughter almost an entire family. Yes, it was. It's very hard to find words to describe the horror and brutality of this despicable crime. Lynn Russell was bludgeoned over 20 times, probably with a hammer. Any one of those blows would have caused her death. Young Megan, an equal number of blows, each of which could have caused her death. Josephine witnessed that. She witnessed her mother and her sister being killed. They even killed her pet dog. And she will be able to provide some crucial information, you hope? Well, I've got to say, and what is good news about this is Josephine has made a remarkable recovery, and I do believe in the very near future she'll be speaking to us. Now, you have those three important leads to follow up, all within about half an hour of the murder. Crucially, the one of the, the chap acting very strangely beside the parked car. Yes, he was acting strangely, and for a some considerable length of time, about 10 minutes. The thing that's so crucial about that is that we found the towel in which contains the blood of our victims. Now, another beige or light-colored car was uh, seen about 15 minutes earlier, and the driver behind that car was able to give you a very good description of the driver. A very good description, indeed. Um, he was described as in his 20s or 30s, fair complexion, ruddy. Um, he, perhaps the most noticeable feature about him was his hair. It was light in colour, perhaps even ginger, with a noticeable fringe, and he was wearing a red T-shirt. Do you think the car was the same in both situations? I think there's every chance it was. It wasn't very far away, and it was described very similarly. So what did the car look like, actually? The car was um, light in colour, medium-sized, uh, perhaps an escort-type vehicle. I think one of the most uh, prevalent features about it was an anti-static strip, which is basically a piece of rubber that uh, comes down from the back bumper onto the road to, to avoid travel sickness. I think it might have had a GB sticker, probably quite old, maybe a B-registered uh, uh, car, headrests with oblong holes. Now, the other sighting, near Chillenden Village, a different description of a man, but possibly involved as well. Aye, it was a different description. Um, this could be a vital witness. It al also could suggest maybe there were two offenders. Now, I know you've made appeals over the weeks for several witnesses to come forward, more information, but at the end of the day today, you want to make a very personal appeal, don't you? I do indeed. Um, I would appeal to anybody who may be a family member, may be a close friend of the person responsible for this. When this happened, I think blood would have appeared on clothing. I think maybe the offender could be injured. But I think psychologically, this person must be damaged in some way. And my appeal tonight is anybody who's got the slightest idea at all, please, please come forward. Pick the phone up tonight and call us. Dave, thank you very much. Well, we all here can only echo that. Please call if you can help, if you have any information. 0500 600 600. It's a free call number here, live to the studio. 0500 600 600. Or the incident room in Kent, which has been set up especially for Crime Watch calls. That's 01622 654 321. That's easy to remember. Maidstone 654 321. In Lancashire, and the murder of a university student. Janet Murgatroyd. It's almost three months, Saturday the 15th of June. That was a memorable day though, the big bomb in Manchester went off that morning and England played Scotland in the European Championship that afternoon. But for Janet it was a day for celebration. She just finished her exams and it was one of the warmest weekends of the year.
Right. There was a body, that of a young woman. It had been in the water only about half an hour. Janet was 20, a local girl who went to the local university. She was studying law and had just completed her first year. She'd planned to go into Manchester that day to shop for clothes, but changed her mind. Then, hearing of the Arndale Centre bomb, she was thankful that she'd cancelled. That afternoon, Janet met up with a friend from university. Oh, I didn't tell you. I bought a Greek phrase book. I'll lend it you if you like. Yeah, yeah. During the holidays, the two planned to go Not backpacking really. through really Europe. Because it says you've got to learn the alphabet first. Oh, that. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I'd never travelled around Europe before, and Janet hadn't, so it was going to be a new experience for both of us that we were going to share together. We couldn't have been happier. We were both on top of the world that day. We really were. We thought nothing was going to stop us from here on in. That was it. We were free to do whatever we wanted for those ten weeks. And we were going to make sure we were going to do them as well. So what, spend a month there? What, in Greece? No, no, I think we should live a bit earlier, spend more time in Italy. I think I'm going to like the Italians. But aren't they supposed to pinch your bum all the time? Maybe we'd better get an Italian phrase, because I don't <laughs> We were very happy. We'd, we'd been in the pub quite a lot of the afternoon. And it was going to be our last night out before we went on our holidays. We were making it a good night. It's really crowded out here. What about there? Yeah, Excuse me, are these seats taken? Oh, you're right. It was towards the end of the night and we had had a lot to drink by that stage. So we decided to stay in the Adelphi for last orders. Somehow we got we got separated and we ended up making parting company and going our own way home. And that was the last time I ever saw Janet. And and I remember thinking to myself that I should wait for her and make sure that she got in a taxi safely, or to make sure that she came back to my flat with me. But it it just didn't happen and. And the worst of it is I can't even remember the last thing that I said to her or the last thing that she said to me. Janet really had had quite a lot to drink and maybe found it hard to get a taxi. At any rate, shortly before 1am, she was heading towards Penwortham Bridge. Security cameras tracked her as she weaved her way down Fishergate. I remember that night because I was late picking my mother up from her sisters. Look at that girl, walking by herself at this hour. Shall we give her a lift? Yeah, uh, she'll be all right. Stop. Mother wanted me to stop, give the girl a lift. Yeah, she looks drunk. She's so I just said to my mother, there's no way I'm going to give her a lift. She could be sick in the car. And we just carried on our way home. Did you see Janet waiting at the start of Penwortham Bridge? And did you see anyone else in the vicinity? shouting at somebody, could have been anybody on the path, anything. You get it a lot down here, people coming from town, clubs and everything. So I never thought nothing more about it, I just went to back to bed. A cab driver saw two significant events around this time. I remember as I approached the bridge, I saw a couple in front of the Volvo garage, they were arguing. She was told than he was. And as I turned onto the bridge, I saw a man running across the front of me. And then I saw a girl in front of him, it looked like he was chasing her. Perhaps I should have stopped. 
About 15 minutes later, half past one or so, these two brothers were coming across Penwortham Bridge. We've been out since Preston at Tokyo Joe's nightclub and of course it was a nice warm night. We decided to walk home. When we reached the far side of the bridge, I heard a noise, that of a girl, it was a moaning, groaning sound. I've, well, I've worked in a dental surgery and it reminded me of a noise somebody makes when they're coming out of anaesthetic, like they're incapable of talking. It is um, a funny area and we have seen stranger things before and nothing has come of that, so we just carried on where we didn't think twice about it. Janet probably lay unconscious on the riverbank until the tide rose on Sunday morning, picked her up and carried her upstream. She had massive head injuries but died finally of drowning. Her clothes were found beside Penwortham Bridge. I can only hope that Janet didn't suffer. I, I can only feel hatred towards the person that's killed her. Absolute total hatred. And also disgust at whomever is shielding him. And, uh, and I hope that they don't sleep at nights, really. Because I find it difficult to sleep at nights. Um, I, I wake up sometimes at two and three in the morning thinking, well, I'll just check that Janet's home. And then, and then I burst into tears because I know she's never going to come home. Um, and that's foul. And someone knows. Someone is shielding. Janet's killer. I'm absolutely certain of that. Um, so I just hope that this helps, really. Three months after the murder, this morning, at the parish church near her home in Penwortham, Janet was finally buried. Graham Gooch, you think her attacker was likely a local man. How would local people recognize him? How would they know him? Well, th this is a man who has committed a very serious offense. It will play on his mind. He will have, his behavior may have probably changed just after the event, and he will still be thinking about it. He will still want to tell somebody about it, and may have told somebody about it. Given the extraordinary level of violence, it seems most unlikely he wouldn't have done something approaching this before. I mean, is this going to be a man with a criminal record, with a violent past? Well, certainly, I'm convinced that he has attacked women before. He may not have had um, a criminal record because the women may not have reported, but this is a man who's used violence on women before, and I believe if he's not caught, he will do it again. You think that? Yes. Piecing together the physical descriptions you've got of him, how do you describe him? Well, the man we're looking for is about five foot ten to six foot tall. He's a white or pale-skinned Asian man. We know he's got black hair. He was wearing a long-sleeved white shirt and very dark, probably black trousers. Now, there are several people you need to eliminate. First of all, the two people arguing at the Volvo garage, but others who were seen on security cameras in the area. First, the two men who were walking down Fishergate Hill just before Janet. Describe the importance of them. Will you? Well, we're particularly anxious to speak to the man we can see on the right in the white shirt with the dark trousers and the dark hair. Um, we really need to find out who he is uh, to eliminate him from the inquiry because he was going just ahead of Janet. It says the 16th of June. Actually, it's late on the night of uh, Saturday the 15th, early in the morning of Sunday the 16th of June, about 1 a.m. Then there was a man walking up Strand Road. To, roughly, th those two roads meet, of course, just before Penwortham Bridge. Yes, this man was walking towards the scene of the murder at about the right time, so he will have arrived on the, uh, the bridge about the same time as Janet. We can see him walking towards the bridge and later a better picture of him coming back. Now, he was there at the right time. We really do need to speak to him. There's not much going on around that area at the time, so who was he? If you can help in any way, do please call 0500 600 600. 0500 600 600. Even if you've just suspicions, you can try the instant room at Preston. That's on 01772 410828. That's Preston in Lancashire, 410828.
Crime Watch often gets the hardest crimes to crack. The toughest of them all are often murders where the victim is a prostitute. No one wants to know, or those who do are perhaps too worried for their reputations to come forward. And that is the case with Jackie Gallagher from Paisley, who was murdered in the early hours of a Monday morning in June. She was a part-time prostitute who took heroin as well, and so far the police have had very little help from members of the public. But Jackie Gallagher deserved much better. I just feel that the public in general, they're just looking at newspapers and reading Jacqueline prostitute hooker. I mean, it really doesn't matter what Jacqueline did. She was a human being, and I think the public have got to understand this. She was a lovely girl. It didn't matter what she did, she was still my daughter. And I'm just asking the public if, if they do know anything to come forward, whether it's trivial to them but it may be held to police. It's Monday, the 24th of June. Jackie left her home in Fox Bar to make the 50-minute journey into Glasgow city centre. She got to Bothwell Street at half past one, was seen by a colleague and a friend she'd met while working on the streets. Hey, yeah, you're not going home already, are you? Nah, I haven't any fags. Would you mind running me down to the garage? Oh, here, here. Have one of mine. Oh, thanks. But I'll need some on for later on. Well, jump in then, I'll take you down there. Sir. Are you through here tonight, now? Nah, I've never seen her. I would often see Jackie in the square and she would give me a wave and I would stop and talk to her. Over the weeks, I saw her many times. Only once did she ask me if I wanted business. I declined because I thought she was too nice a lassie. I didn't want to be regarded by her as a punter. They drove to the Burma garage in Broomilaw, where Jackie was recorded by the security video at 1.31 a.m. Have ten cup, please. 147. Thank you. Cheers, thanks. They left the garage a minute later and then went to buy some soft drinks. Jackie was then seen arriving in Bothwell Street just after 2 a.m. Would you mind hanging about and giving me a lift home later? No, but don't leave it too long. I'll hang about till three, then I'll come back and pick you up here, okay? Okay, cheers, thanks. See you later. Take care. I'll see you later then. Bye. Bye. See you. Bothwell Street is a regular haunt for prostitutes, but Jackie didn't come into the city centre that often. When she did, she'd take up a pitch under the clock at the junction of Blytheswood Street. 20 minutes later, at 2.27, a black BMW was seen in the area. Who was the driver? When the taxi driver eventually left, Jackie was still standing at the corner. He was the last known person to see her alive. I wasn't too bothered when she didn't turn up because she'd kept me waiting in the past. I thought she'd maybe get back to a flat with a punter. At about the same time, a black BMW was spotted passing the corner where Jackie was last seen. I was travelling along the A82 towards the Erskine Bridge when my attention was drawn to the lay-by just before bowling and I saw a black BMW. It looked like a 5 series motor vehicle sitting in the lay-by and I could see a man dressed in denim jacket, denim jeans, walking away from the vehicle towards Oco Patrick. Five hours later, Jackie's body was discovered in the same lay-by. 
Police sealed off the scene. Detective Chief Inspector Jeanette Joyce arrived to take charge and scenes of crime officers gathered to preserve the evidence. I think it's terrible that Jacqueline's body was just dumped with an old curtain wrapped around her. I mean, a sick animal gets put to sleep with some dignity. My daughter never got that choice. I know that Jacqueline will never rest herself, so whether Jacqueline is lying in a cold morgue or whether she was buried, it's, she's still not going to rest. She'll not be resting to the person's court that killed her, that took her life. And I'll never rest either. Heartfelt, heartfelt words of a loving mother. Detective Chief Inspector Jeanette Joyce, this was an utterly ruthless and brutal murder, wasn't it? Yes, it was a very violent attack for no apparent reason. Jacqueline suffered very severe injuries, which leads me to believe that her attacker could well have been bloodstained and may in fact be injured himself. Now let's look at some of the major clues you have. As we know, Jackie's body was wrapped in a curtain. Now we have an exact copy of the one that was at the scene, don't we, here? It's quite a long one, about nine feet by five feet. Yes, it's quite an unusual curtain. In fact, we believe it has been hung in a building a pre built pre-World War II or, in fact, a tenement flat. Now, when the curtain is found, there are actually hooks in the curtain, and we have one on display tonight. Yes, this one here. It's a common or garden plastic curtain hook, but it's unusual to find a curtain still with the hooks in. Yes, very much so. Another unusual aspect of this curtain is the lining, which is not standard curtain lining. It's white dressmaking cotton with a blue polka dot design. Very unusual. And I am of the impression that this curtain has been made on a domestic sewing machine. It's very roughly made, so anyone who remembers making a curtain like this, or indeed s perhaps selling the material, anyone like that you'd like to hear from? Yes, absolutely. It would be a vital step forward for this inquiry. Now, what about the cars, the BMW? Three sightings of a BMW. Significant? Yes, obviously we cannot ignore the fact that two black-coloured BMW motor cars were seen driving about the area where Jacqueline was last seen. However, more significantly, about quarter past four that Monday morning, the 24th of June, there is a black-coloured car seen in the lay-by where Jacqueline's body was later found. And we believe that that car is a 5 Series BMW. And I would ask the driver of that vehicle to come forward so we can eliminate him from the inquiry. And there was also a man in denims and a denim shirt. Yes, he was seen walking away from the car. And I believe he may have seen something important to this inquiry. Now, as we said earlier, Jackie was a prostitute, so therefore your inquiry must be made that much more difficult because potential witnesses, people who knew her, who saw her that night, may be obviously reticent to come forward. Yes, it's been made very difficult. However, as Jacqueline's mum, Alice, said in the reconstruction, it doesn't matter what Jacqueline was. She was a human being, first and foremost. And really, I would wish people to be more forthcoming in this inquiry, especially clients who were with Jacqueline on the Monday night, the 24th of June. It doesn't matter why they were with Jacqueline, but what they saw and what they can tell us about Jacqueline's movements after 2 o'clock that morning are absolutely vital. Well, thank you very much indeed, Jeanette Joyce. Well, here is the number. Please call. Please, please call. Tre calls will be treated with the greatest discretion, I promise. And you can speak to officers or perhaps BBC staff if you prefer. That's our free call number. Or you can try the incident room in Dumbarton. That's 01389 822 000. That's Dumbarton 822 000. Missing. At what point should you assume there's been foul play? It's a regular dilemma for the police because, after all, most missing people turn up safe and well. In this case, though, detectives have assumed the worst, and that means murder. Melanie Hall went missing back in June from the centre of Bath near her home in Wiltshire, and no one's seen her since. But one week after her disappearance, a conversation was overheard just outside Melanie's home village. We were walking along the uh, Kennet and Avon Canal towards Bradford and Avon. Uh, we noticed a black and white cat just ran up our path onto a canal boat. No, I don't believe you. Nothing happened with Melanie. Why should it such a guilty man? It wasn't until a couple of days later that the name Melanie actually twigged that it could be connected to the Melanie Hall case. That narrowboat may well be immaterial, but it hasn't yet been traced. 
It was dark blue with a beige interior and the couple were aged late twenties to early thirties. Melanie was twenty-five, a graduate in psychology intending to do a PhD. Melanie was a lovely girl, a wonderful daughter, full of life, looking forward to the future. She had finished her degree a year ago and had probably taken the year out to just enjoy life. Melanie's mum works at the Royal United Hospital in Bath and found Melanie a temporary job as a clerical assistant. She'd almost completed a year working at the hospital and she'd started a new relationship with one of the doctors and she was hoping to move into her own little house within six weeks. Oh, oh hi, Melanie, hi. hello. Is everything okay for this weekend? Um, yeah, um, I've got to go home first and pick up my stuff, but I'll meet you at Walls later if that's okay, yeah? Yeah. Okay, great. Stuff. Great. Oh, oh uh, that's my people going. I'll catch you later. Okay, maybe see you for lunch, yeah? Yeah. Okay, bye. Bye, Melanie appeared to me an affectionate and attractive woman. I sort of dated her three weeks and we did quite a lot of things together. We went out for meals, to the cinema, to clubs and had a very good time actually. Saturday the 8th of June and they started the evening at a barbecue with friends. Hello, how are you, how are you doing? I like your dress. Yeah, I got it today, help me choose yeah. it. Good, Don't yeah? feel it. What have we got there? Lots of stuff for the barbecue. Listen, everybody's out there so you might ever just go and pop it. In the fridge, yeah. Then? No problem. Later that night, four of them decided to go night clubbing. This is Walcott Street in you Bath. Have to be the worst driver on the planet. How's that chicken, oh, Steve? No, it's it's really 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 it should have been one of them. I went to the loon and I came back to the dance floor and I sort of had a look across the dancing floor and I saw Melanie dancing with another man. Initially I couldn't believe it because I was so surprised. I became rather disappointed and a bit upset as well. I couldn't explain it. We had a wonderful time and we're in really good spirits and we're out to have some fun and she was dancing with this other man and in a rather intimate fashion so I went to the car to wait for her. I just needed some time to sort myself out and think about what happened. Smoked a cigarette and I was waiting for some sort of reaction. Either that Melanie would come out of the club and sort of look for me. She knew where the car was, so... And I was just waiting and nothing really happened and I decided I go home. Listen, we're going to go now. Yeah, we're just both really tired. Oh, All right, right so I'll see you Monday. Okay, okay see, see you later. Monday. See ya. See, see you later. Later. Bye. Bye. The friends left at ten past one, assuming Philip was still there to take Melanie home. Hey, I was still on the stairs, talking to the bank, sir. And I saw a pretty girl sitting there. I was talking to a bloke, like five foot ten. Um, with a dark complexion, very tidy dress, black trousers, silk brown shirt, black shoes, and a very flashy watch. A little while later, I seen the couple lead the club together. Hey, there you go. Uh, here we go. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yes, please. We were heading along Walcott Street towards Cadillac's nightclub. On the way up, we spotted a couple arguing outside the church hall. He was giving her a hard time, wasn't he? Yeah, lovers too. The lady had very blonde hair. He was about five foot ten, had dark hair, and was wearing a black bomber-style jacket. At the same time, further up Walcott Street, towards Bath city centre, a blonde in a light-coloured dress was seen being coaxed into the podium car park. If this wasn't Melanie, who was it? On Monday, Melanie failed to turn up at work. I was concerned, but I did wonder if she'd taken the day off. 
and I put a note on there asking her to contact me as soon as possible. But by the evening there'd been no sign of her and the note stayed there for several days. I did feel right from the very first day that something has happened to her and as the days have gone by and the weeks and the months I'm quite sure something serious has happened to her. She had everything to look forward to. She was young, attractive, had so much to look forward to in her life and I'm sure she wouldn't have done this of her own free will. If she is still alive, I'd, I would like just to know where she is so that we could just put our minds at rest. But if she's dead, we really badly need to know. So at least we could just bring her home. Now, the last couple of days, you might have seen publicity about this case um, in the Bristol Evening Post and today's papers here in the National. The case of, of Melanie Hall, who's missing, has been linked with the murder of Louise Smith last Christmas, almost uh, a year ago, and with about half a dozen rapes and uh, attempted rapes that have taken place over about six years. Now, Steve Livings, do you think it's the same offender? I don't know. I deal in physical evidence and fact, and at this time... There's no physical evidence or fact to link Melanie Hall's disappearance with the murder of Louise Smith or the series of rapes that have happened in Bath. All right, well, look, let's just stick with the disappearance of, of Melanie for the moment. The most obvious man to find is the chap who was seen at the night, at Cadillac's nightclub talking to somebody who looked very much like Melanie. Yes, this man was sat in an armchair with a girl described similarly to Melanie. He's about five foot seven. He's dark hair, quite noticeable because he's tanned, very tanned, and he's wearing a flashy gold watch on his wrist. Now, he might not have been with Melanie, and even if he was with Melanie, there's no evidence she was abducted at this point. No. In fact, I, I've got a belief that Melanie may have been befriended by somebody. In that last 40 minutes, the club was open. Her friends have gone. She may have realised that. And I believe she may have gone off with somebody voluntarily. Maybe she got in somebody's car outside with this, whoever she went with. It's that person I appeal to. Did you take Melanie? Did you go away with her that night? Please help us. Telephone us now. OK, this is the night of Saturday, the 8th of June. What about the, the sightings outside the club? There were two. First, of course, the, the couple who were seen, and I think somebody said, oh, he seemed to be giving her a hard time. And then a little later on, the girl seeing slightly manhandled into a, into a car park. That's right. The similarity is this. All those girls are similarly described as Melanie young blonde lady now it may be that that's not melanie at all and again please come forward so that i can eliminate you from our inquiries and again the sighting on the kennet naven canal likely to be a red herring that is it could well be a red herring it's just the name melanie it's just a chance perhaps the witness got it wrong i don't know okay well if you can help resolve any of those sightings here's the number it's a free call don't hesitate and of course don't hesitate if you've heard anything about this case and can help in that way oh five hundred six hundred six hundred Mr. Livings has several colleagues here tonight. Others are at the instant room in Bath, which is on 01225 842460. That's Bath 842460. Now, there's nothing strange about the fact that Crime Watch often appeals to criminals, perhaps in more ways than one. The fact is, they often hold the key to solving cases. But, of course, they also have their own moral code, even if it isn't exactly yours or mine, and almost all stop a long way short of murder. In this case, the victim was herself something of a petty crook. In fact, she was on a community service order when she died. She was pretty loud, she was boisterous, she was what they call a character, well known in South London as a go-between, a pickpocket and a thief. This is Northcote Road in Clapham, two days before Jill Williams died. Somehow she'd come into several hundred pounds and went straight to the pawnbrokers where she used to lodge her jewellery whenever she was short of cash. Hello, love. Hi, Jill. Hello, love. How are you? I'm fine, you? Yeah, fine. Good. Oh, I've Jill was in somewhere. one fantastic mood. She was yeah. really bubbly. She was getting yeah. her jewellery out. Where's that, Nigel? Hello, Jill. Hello, you all right there? Yeah. How are you? £212. Pounds. Is that right? That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. 
That particular day, she came in and uh, she took out the majority of the jewellery, which was unusual. She'd try and take out a piece at a time, but this particular day, she came and she took the majority of it all out. A ball with all coloured stones in, which she There's loved. Me I love me bauble. Um, <laughs> a pendant, uh, another chain and a ring. And she said that she was coming back next week to get the rest of the jewellery out, which I think were two bracelets. Jill's jewellery was like her best friend, if you like. I mean, that was everything she owned, basically. I mean, I even said to her, you're crazy to walk about with that sort of jewellery on. Like, people can't resist it. But no, that was Jill. She didn't care. That was hers. She'd had it for a long time. And she did love her jewellery. There's no two ways about it. This is Ribblesdale Road in Tooting. Jill had lived here for some 20 years. The Tuesday before she died, her upstairs neighbour remembers she had visitors. I left to go to work at about half ten. Came down with, with the cat food to, to leave with Jill and I was quite surprised to see that the Jill? kitchen door was closed, which was unusual because it was nearly always Jill? propped open. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I was just going to put the food down for the cat. Oh, I'm a bit busy right now, love. Um, um, it was quite obvious right? that Jill didn't want me to see what was going on. I knew most of Jill's usual friends and callers, but I didn't recognise this guy. I'd never seen him before. He was early to mid twenties. A very slight olive complexion, about six foot tall, dark short hair, and, and quite pale eyes. All right, love. I'll do it later. All right then. Cheers, Jill. Yeah. Bye bye, love. Bye. bye. And I got the impression that uh, a third person was in there with them. Three days later, the night she died, Friday, June the 21st. Thank you. See your change? Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Hello, Mina. Tell Hello. me I've seen a box of matches, love. Yeah. 155, please. Thank, Thank you. you. You got a lot of jewellery on. You going out today? Might do later, love. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Bye. I had been for a drink after work with some friends on, on the Friday night. Got home around nine o'clock. Uh, I could hear that Jill was home in the lounge. Uh, the TV was on and I, I got the impression that she had company. There was certainly some low conversation going on. So I went upstairs, um, made myself a meal, put a, put a film on, which I watched um, quite late into the night. Jill often had late night visitors, but at half past one, a neighbour opposite saw someone he didn't recognise. There was something strange which woke me from my sleep. I got up out of bed and pulled the curtain back and had a look down into the street. I saw a car under the sodium light. It looked like it was a light fawn coloured car. Uh, beside the car there was a lady who could have been talking, who could have been paying a fare. She was average build, probably somewhere between five foot two, five foot four. Fair hair. The woman walked from the car across the road and into Jill Williams' house. I thought she may have had keys to admit herself, but didn't see her after that. There was nothing left under the shadows. Who is it? Who is it? Next morning, Saturday, June the 22nd. I was working Saturday morning. Um, a man came in, I think he was white. I can't really remember much because we're so busy. Um, you don't really focus on that one person. That'll be 265, please. Great. Thank you. I won't keep you a minute. 
the tickets have numbers on them. So I checked the number and I gave the item back to the man. Here we go. Two gold ID bracelets. And it was only later that I discovered that they were Jill Williams' ticket. I didn't leave the flat until around two o'clock on the Saturday afternoon. Paul? Yeah? I'm going to get a paper. Do you want anything? No, no thanks. All right. I could see that Jill's flat had, had very obviously been turned over. I looked into the kitchen and could see the disarray. Jill? I pushed the lounge door open and that's when I found her. Jill Williams had been beaten and then suffocated. Her beloved jewellery and her pawn tickets had gone. Brian Anderson, the woman visitor, the late night visitor. You've got to trace her, obviously. That's correct. Um, she was about five foot five in height, uh, with dark blonde hair and a pleat or a bun. Uh, very little known about her at all. Uh, but she was likely to be the last person to see Jill alive. Um, it's still unclear whether she actually was at Jill's flat on the Thursday night or the Friday night, but it's imperative that uh, we speak to her to eliminate her. I'm sure she has useful information uh, about Jill uh, and possibly the murder itself. Now, three or four days before the murder, we've got this chap and possibly one other person in Jill's kitchen don't want to be seen. Presumably there's some deal going on there they're not too, too keen on, on anybody else knowing about. And supposing that guy or those people watching, they would like to help you solve this murder. They certainly don't want to be connected to it, but perhaps they were involved with a drugs deal or something like that. Are you going to prosecute them for a drugs deal if they come forward? If I can say this, that our prim primary, our primary role is to deal with the murder of Jill Williams, not with uh, extremely minor drugs offences. Um, I do not want to make that an issue to deter people from contacting us. Okay, let's take a look at that, uh, that man. Tell us what you can about him. He's uh, about six foot in height, slim, uh, dark hair, uh, sort of olive complexion. Can I just stress, he's not a suspect, um, but he'll certainly have useful information about Joe. This is uh, elimination, and this is a replica of one of the principal items of jewellery that was stolen. As you can see, it's pretty distinctive. If anybody has offered you anything like that, or you've suddenly seen something like this in South London, let us know. Do call if you can help. 0500 600 600. The call costs you nothing. 0500 600 600. And apart from the studio, lines are open now to the incident room on 0181 649 2604. That's 0181 649 2604. Grief. Caroline Glachen was the typical girl next door, typical that is for a 14-year-old in Bon Hill, just north of Glasgow. That meant on a Saturday night in the summer holidays, sometimes staying out until the early hours. But on the night of Saturday, the 24th of August, something went dreadfully wrong. Caroline was 14 and she thought she was quite grown up, but she still had a lot of childlike ways. The other side, she was the teenager with the clothes and music and the makeup. She was an affectionate child. Um, she always kissed and cuddled before she went to bed, before she went out. She never failed. Um, she even did it with her grandparents. Caroline, she was unique. She was unique to me. Caroline's hometown, Bonhill, is separated from Renton by the River Leven that flows on to Dumbarton. On Saturday, August the 24th, Caroline spent the afternoon visiting friends on both sides of the Leven, and shortly after nine that evening, she took her normal route home along the river. Mum! Thank 
day's finest honey. What do you think? Oh, I love weddings. Are you wearing my earrings again? Oh, I'm just borrowing them, honey. Oh, honey, me. I can't even wear rings. What you, you know doing? you're not allowed to take things without asking. You never wear them anyway. Where they hide when they see me coming? You got a name yet? Caroline's mother was going out that evening, heading off with her fiancé to celebrate her 40th birthday. Mind your time! Aye! No, listen to me. You mind your time, lady. I don't want you staying out all night, do you hear me? Aye! Is that my keys? Aye. Right, have a nice time. Mwah. Enjoy your birthday dinner. Aye. Bye! Bye! Caroline met up with one of her friends and together they spent the next couple of hours drifting round and meeting pals. At ten to midnight they left a friend's flat and started walking once again. Caroline was one of my closest friends. She made me laugh and that evening we were just going to visit some friends. Do you want to stay at my house tonight? Come on, what's about? It's your birthday. Aye, whatever. Right, well I'm going to see my pals. Do you want to come with me? No, I just want to stay and watch a video. Right then, um, you take my keys. I'll just go myself. Hey guys, come here! Hey guys, come here! This is a few hundred yards away at about the same time. Who was on that scrambler bike? He's an important witness because he was on the towpath that Caroline was heading for. You can watch a video when I get back. What videos have you got? Uh, there's hundreds of them. Just keep Joanne company. I'll be back in it too. Right, we do that, Wally. Yeah. Eat my way. See you later. See you later. So, not keen on watching the video, Caroline now took to the towpath across town to find her other friends. This taxi had just picked up a shift worker from a warehouse beside the river. I know her. I wonder what she's doing down here this time of the night. The man was about 20 to 25 years old, about 5 foot 4 to 5 foot 6, average build. He had sideburns, sharp features and was clean shaven. The jacket seemed to be a green colour and the hood had a light lining. Caroline was due back at 2 o'clock but I was that tired, I just fell asleep before she was due in. This man lives a couple of hundred yards from the river. I was asleep and just heard these two screams, loud. I jumped out of my bed and I looked towards the water side. Then there was now a soul of a movement. I went back to my bed and uh, on and off, on and off thinking what could have happened. Caroline's body was in the water. She had been violently attacked and by now had been dead for some hours. She was 14 and a half years old. Dear Mrs. Glacken, it's very difficult to find the words right now, but I wanted to let you know how deeply sorry I am about Caroline. She was a very special wee girl and we were all very fond of her. She used to visit us regularly and would just sit for a chat. We always ended up laughing. She took a genuine interest in people and we got to know Caroline more than most because of her personality. I miss her terribly and will never forget her. Our prayers and thoughts are with you. She was, she was my wife, she was everything. I always felt she was a gift. Um, and was, you'll not get any more special gift than what she was to me. 
obviously a very popular and much loved young girl. Jeanette Joyce, um, you have an artist impression, as we saw on the film, of a man seen following Caroline, but you also have a likeness of someone you'd like to come forward as well, haven't you? Yes, tonight we're releasing an e-fit of a man who we believe regularly walks his dog in Delichip Park in Old Bourne Hill. Now, we believe he's had some amount of contact, a small amount of contact with Caroline and although he hasn't been seen for some months we'd still like him to come forward so we can eliminate him from the inquiry and he's described as 30-35 years of age, stocky built, he is tanned skinned, a ruddy complexion, has dark hair, a dark moustache and wears black clothing and including a black baseball cap. Now, witness is obviously very important at that time of night. The Veil of Leaven Academy is quite close to where she was attacked, isn't it? Yes, the Veil of Leaven Academy and the grounds of the Academy overlook the part of the towpath where Caroline was attacked. Now, about midnight, we know that two people left the grounds of the Academy. One is a female, and we would ask them to come forward. If they are listening to this programme tonight and recognise themselves, please telephone us now. Could there may be many other people on the towpath at that time of night? Well, I believe because the towpath is so dark, Caroline's attacker knew the area and was comfortable there. I would appeal for fishermen who use the towpath, including poachers, to contact us without delay. And I would just send a message to the poachers. I'm not interested in why you were down there, but what you saw and what you heard could be vital to the inquiry. And I would really remind the public in general that we're approaching Christmas and Caroline's mum and dad have lost a much-loved daughter, in fact, their only child. Jeanette Joyce, thank you very much. We're all with you on that. There is also a substantial reward in this case as well. Here is the number 0500 600 600. There are BBC researchers here along with the detectives. That's 0500 600 600. And there are more investigating officers waiting now in Dumbarton. The number there, if you prefer to call, is 01389 000. That's Dumbarton 000. Brief appeal about a tragic and unusual crime in Lincolnshire. As a result, detectives have gathered from Crime Watch viewers several more sightings and enough new evidence to turn the case into a reconstruction. It's about Mrs Vera Lever, who lived in the village of Tetney, just south of Grimsby, and the events you're about to see unfold took place 12 weeks ago. Our scene starts on Thursday, September the 19th. Mum lived in Tetney about 47 years, and most people knew who my mum was. Hi, Mum, you OK? Mm, I'm fine. On the Thursday morning, I come round, because she'd got this letter from the gas board, and it was worrying her. So, well, of course not, Mum. <laughs> she was a very caring person. She had a very generous nature, and um, she was a lovely mum, and she liked having all her family around her. Well, that's sorted out, then. What do you want done about this one? Do you want it thrown out? Oh, no. You fill it in if you want to. I normally go through a mail and uh, there was this shopping survey. I was going to post it when I left, but I forgot, so it got left on the table. Dawn the following day, Friday, September the 20th. I just left home around 5, 5, 10. Drove to Techni down Station Road. As I approached the junction of the A16, I saw the chap stood on the right-hand side, right back near the hedge. I had a second glance at him as I pulled out, and I thought, I wonder what he's doing at this time of morning, stood there near the hedge. Because he didn't look, you know, as though he was waiting for a lift. Who was the man? How did he get there? And did anyone else see him? Tetney, two miles away and two and a half hours later. As I reversed out of the drive on my way to work, I saw a man walking towards me. He was dressed in dark clothing. He was aged in his 30s to 40s. The main thing I remember about him was the amount of stubble that he had on his face. He seemed very much out of place, not somebody that you would normally see in the village. <laughs> Come on, G. There you go. I'll see you. Come on. 
Just around the corner from Vera's house, a neighbor noticed two men. One was rough looking, the other was smart and walking a dog. Who was he? He could be an important witness. Further down the road, the scruffy man was seen again. I was just getting dressed and I saw this guy and I thought, hmm, I've never seen him before around here. He was about five foot eleven to six foot tall, of normal to stocky build, um, rough looking. He had dark wavy hair and he had a bit of stubble on his face, quite a pale complexion. I noticed him again from the reflection across the way. He was walking towards the cutting. Oh, better go and post these, didn't I? Now, you can't come this time. You can come a bit later, OK? Good girl. At about 8.30, a neighbour noticed Vera heading for the cutting, a footpath that led through to the post box. The cutting is quite a busy thoroughfare between gardens through the village. Morning. A villager heard moans, but thought no more about it. Technic 298394. I, 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 I went to post the letters. Down the footpath. And I was attacked. I can't believe it. I, I, I felt so sorry for my mum to have to go through something like that at, at her age. I mean, it'd be bad enough for anybody, but, f you know, for somebody of my mum's age. You know, I felt shaky for me mum. You know, as if it had happened to me, so, you know. Hello? We need your help. My mother's been raped. Half an hour later, on the busy A16 from Louth to Grimsby, as I was driving towards Tolbar Roundabout, I spotted a man in dark clothing, heavily dressed for the type of morning it was. He had a black woolly hat on. I thought the jumper could have possibly been navy blue and his jeans possibly black. He was a thick-set man, tall, and his hair was black, turning grey. Did you see him that day? That afternoon, Vera came home from hospital and went to run a bath. Within moments, she suffered a major stroke. To think what she went through in the morning and then to die in the afternoon, you know, we couldn't believe it after all that she'd gone through and then she died. I mean, we all know she'd still be here now if that hadn't have happened to her in the morning. I always thought she was going to live to be in her 90s and now it's all been taken away from her. Martin Bontoft, how good a description was Vera, able, Vera Labour able to give you? Yes, yeah, she was able to give us a description of her attacker, and, and that was that he was a white male. He was 30 to 40 years old. He was around six feet tall, and she described him of a muscular physique. Uh, he had several days uh, growth of stubble on his face, to three to four days growth of stubble, uh, and she particularly remembered that he had piercing, menacing eyes. He was wearing a, a black woolen hat and he had a, a top or jumper on that was rough to the touch and dark trousers or jeans. Now let's take a close up at that artist's impression and right. I sh should say this is what you describe as a composite. Now what does that mean and what are the limitations? Yes, what that means is that that is a, a, an artist's impression that has been made up from a variety of different uh, witnesses. It 
it is not meant as an exact um, image of the of, of the offender necessarily, or even the person that was seen in that area. It is a rough guide. Do you think he's done this sort of thing before? I think that this man will have committed this type of offence in the past. Yes. So there may be women watching, have been frightened by him, have been approached by him, even perhaps raped by him. Absolutely. Who you yes. want to call in? Yes, absolutely. And you've got DNA evidence, so you can eliminate people very quickly. Yes, it's made things much simpler now. If we do get any suspects, we simply need to to invite them to give us a sample. We can get a DNA profile from that and compare it with the one we've got. And if you think he's done this before in the past, presumably you're concerned he'll do it again in the future. I'm very concerned and think that he may try it again, yes. Whatever help you think you have, do please call 0500 600 600. It's free and it could stop a repetition. 0500 600 600 or you could try the incident room direct on 01522 532 222. That's Lincoln 532 222.